Hey guys, hey, Montel here, and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Free Thinking with Montel. And I am so excited about having my guest that I have on today. But before we get to him, just want to back up a little bit and make sure you know, you know, every now and then with Free Thinking, I do kind of go into something very, very personal, and I hope you don't mind. But, you know, it's a personal discussion about, you know, what a lot of you know I've been very public about, and that has been my battle with MS now for uh, really probably around 40 years, though I've been diagnosed for 20 years. And a part of my entire journey has been my guest today, um, who has been a stalwart consultant and, and advisor to me since uh, my first diagnosis. Um, I, I literally have reached out to him on multiple occasions just to pick his brain and just to, to see if he can, you know, help to lift my spirits up, you know, and, and why? Because, you know, something that I didn't talk about that much with my early diagnosis was the depression that it sent me into. Um, I will tell you, I was diagnosed, you know, um, really in 1999, and then, you know, technically got my, my confirmation in early 2000, January 2000. And for about a year and a half after that, I literally chased the opioid train for uh, about a year and a half, uh, trying to deal with what was, you know, and was still one of my main symptoms, which is extreme neuropathic pain, but I've been able to get that under control. But one of the things I had a very difficult time controlling was my emotional state um, sent me on a path that literally I was on a spiral that I couldn't get myself out of. Um, I blame myself for the illness. I blame myself for all of the symptoms. I blame myself, blame myself, blame myself to the point that, you know, um, I know for a fact it was affecting me and affecting the progression of my disease. There's no question now. I mean, I've you know, I'm sure that, you know, a doctor may argue with me that maybe that wasn't as important as it was, but I'm going to say it literally whipped my butt, um, made um, um, every one of my symptoms, I think, were more exacerbated when I was dealing with this crazy feeling of, you know, futility. I, I, I literally didn't know what to do. And it wasn't until I called upon this friend of mine who helped me during a legal situation I was in. And while he was helping me during that, I don't think he even knows that he was helping me emotionally because I recognized some of the things that he was saying in his testimony that, you know, I wasn't to blame, that this was truly something that was a true manifestation of my illness. And it made me stop and, and really put me in check. And I've worked on a lot of different things. Some of them I'm going to ask him about today and that may have had some sort of impact on my journey. But, you know, there are so many people out there that are suffering from illness, and especially right now during this crazy time of, you know, the pandemic. I think, you know, I've been speaking to several doctors across the country who have said, Mattel, when we get done dealing with this COVID pandemic, America is going to be the leader in another pandemic, and that's going to be the pandemic of mental health issues. We are going to be left with, you know, a national depression that I don't think we are ready for and ready to put our hands around. We can see what's going on right now. Uh, you know, we have suicide rates up in almost every demographic group across the country. Um, you know, we have literally focus so much, I think, in news reports about the mental health issues facing our veterans that we seem to ignore the mental health issues that are facing our youth, that are facing our seniors, that are facing every demographic in this country today. And then when you get to neurological disease, oh my God. And I think a lot of people that are at home think, oh, I'm just becoming depressed because of COVID. No, you are not. You're becoming depressed because your illness is forcing that extra little layer of depression on you. And you got to get to a point that I think that, you know, I say you have to get to a point, but I mean, you really have to try to one, reach out and get some help Two, understand there's no shame in that game. Asking for help is nothing shameful. 
It's something that we all need to do from time to time. And right now, I think is one of those times that America needs to stop in the middle of all of the craziness that we're faced with elections and we're faced with you know, news stories of violence going up around the country. We need to stop and focus in on what we do for our mental health and try to keep us at least afloat. And I, I know that sounds like you know I'm, I'm reaching for the lowest common denominator, but we need to stay afloat. We have to. My guest today is a neuropsychiatrist caring for patients with central nervous system uh, neuroinflammatory diseases, such as MS and related MS spectrum disease. His patients have traveled all over the country, all over the world, as far as the Middle East, just to see him. He is a principal psychiatric consultant to Johns Hopkins Multiple Sclerosis Center of Excellence and a clinical director of the Johns Hopkins Pediatric Esketamine Clinic. He's a friend of mine. He's, uh, you know, if I really want to roll off, you know, his bona fides, my God, this guy graduated magna cum laude from Yale University before earning his MD and his PhD at Johns Hopkins. He's an expert in everything from adult psychiatry to aid psychiatry to multiple sclerosis to psychiatry to behavioral science. Please welcome and thank him so much for joining us, Adam Kaplan. Adam, thank you so much for being a part of the show today, sir. Oh, Montel, it is my privilege and pleasure. And I can tell you, you know, that introduction, I'm almost like, well, we're done because you covered all the highlights. Um, you really did. And this is what you do so well. You're such a good communicator. You touch on the highlights of, of these issues. So maybe we could just, you know, explore them more. But I will tell you, what you laid out there, that's the whole picture from the 34,000 foot view. Thank you, sir. And I don't think a lot of people though, are paying attention. That's what really gets me. It's like, you know, those who aren't affected by or inflicted with a neurological disorder are suffering their level of depression, and some of them don't even know it. But then when you add on a neurological disorder, oh my God. Um, you know, let, let's let's start off by first off, let, let, let's explain maybe the, the whole idea of what is neuropsychiatry? So neuropsychiatry is a branch of psychiatry that really deals with how the mind and the brain uh, are in one place. You know, the mind comes from the brain and the brain has an effect on the entire body. So for instance, if you look at MS, it turns out that, you know, MS, the inflammation that's going on affects the brain and it causes the depression, just like it causes any one of the other symptoms that you have. But the depression kind of uh, also has a you know bi-directional influence and the depression makes the MS worse. And in fact, Montel, now we have data um, that's in that shows that it turns out depression is actually a risk factor for getting autoimmune diseases. And this has been shown in MS, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. So these things work very closely and neuropsychiatry is understanding the way the brain and the body are in close connection and they communicate back and forth. So something that affects the body, it's gonna have an influence on the brain, can cause depression, depression can influence the body. You know, I have said since my first diagnosis, when I was first diagnosed that, you know, my nemesis is inflammation. So does depression cause inflammation in the brain? Yeah, so that's a great question. And what it actually does, what the data suggests is that it's when you have depression, we know that depression is a state of having elevated cortisol. So cortisol, people think of cortisol as the stress hormone of the body, and there's nothing more stressful than depression, uh, and that there's some biological reasons why it goes up. But that's one of the biological markers of depression is you make too much cortisol. Well, you know, everybody thinks of cortisol as the stress hormone, but you don't go to the store to buy, you know, something related to cortisol for stress. You go to the store to get cortisol, like prednisone, hydrocortisone, all of these drugs, because it's a break of the immune system. And the problem is, if you're riding that break of the immune system with depression and your cortisol's up, the immune, you're basically, you're wearing out your emergency break. So now if you get an infection or something happens, like Epstein-Barr virus, then your immune system's gonna take off and you won't have that emergency break when you go to pull it. So yes, uh, the depression worsens uh, your, your situation. And okay, so now, you know, again, there's lots of people who tune who tune in this podcast of mine, especially you know MS sufferers and MS survivors. Um, I don't want to give them the impression that depression is inevitable, because it's not correct. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, so on the one hand, it's not their fault if they get it. 50% of people with MS will get a depression at some point following the diagnosis because inflammation is so common. But we know that if you really control the inflammation and bring it down, you treat the depression. So a lot of it relates to just trying to take best care of yourself possible. So you're absolutely right. It's not inevitable. At any given time, 25% of people with MS will have depression. Um, and again, it's just like, is fatigue inevitable? No. Is you know having uh, lower extremity weakness inevitable? No. So it, it affects different people in different ways, but the better control you have of your MS, the, the better your chances of aiding your symptoms. But it, it involves also being you know conscious and aware of the MS. You know, one thing I will say though, this is a very tough time, as you pointed out so well, Montel. But it's interesting because what we're dealing with now in some ways mirrors what's going on with MS, meaning that we know that people who are infected with uh, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that causes COVID-19, basically the level of inflammation that they have with that infection parallels their chances of getting a depression. So it's the same kind of thing where inflammation is driving the depression. On the other hand, we all know that with this stress going on, and this is endless, you know, that it's months and months and months, not just, gee, this pandemic hit, we had to all hunker down and then get through it. This ongoing prolonged period of time causes an increased risk of depression for many people. But, and this is the but, Montel, is that, and, you know, even hearing you talk about it now, um, and you can talk about how far you've come and what an example you are to so many people of recognizing this because of the stigma. People don't want to talk about it. You've always been willing to talk about it. And I really think that to some extent, people who have had MS or have MS have a story of being confronted with something scary uh, that they don't know much about. They don't know when it's, what's going to happen. And so the experiences you have and people with MS have can be stories that they can tell to help other people get through this really, really dangerous time. Like, okay, I got through this. Here how I, here's how I got through it, what I learned. So I think people with MS are actually in a situation where they've overcome this kind of, you know, uh, not knowing what the future will bring uh, kind of thing, where they actually can help other people through their own experiences. Wow. So then look, uh, let's let's back up for just a second. I want to make sure people understand, you know, as a human being, you know, one of the things that differentiates us from all the other animals in the forest is the fact that we do have emotions and we have control in some ways of those emotions. And, you know, depression is kind of a two-edged sword. I mean, you know, if it lasts more than three weeks, then you have a problem, right? But if But if you... You know, you you suffer a trauma of, of any kind. You know, um, you know, death in the family, uh, loss of your job, uh, loss of a relationship, an argument with a spouse or a friend. You know, um, a momentary feeling bad isn't depression, right? That's just being human. Exactly right. So the difference between sadness and depression is sadness is just an emotional state that you have. And depression is when there literally are changes that take place in the brain, often due to inflammation, but it can be due to other things. It can be due to hypothyroidism or a genetic predisposition, but that's different. And what we tell people is it sadness is the depression with cough is to pneumonia. So people will cough while they're watching this and they'll, you know, uh, for many different reasons, dry uh, weather, asthma, many different reasons. So it's the, really, it's the company that the cough keeps. If it's a cough with a rapid heart rate, uh, sorry, rapid breathing uh, and sort of a consolidation on a chest X-ray and an elevated temperature, we call that pneumonia. What we call depression is when you have sadness often, but not even necessary. It can be loss of interest or pleasure and then changes in your sleep and your um Feelings about yourself just, you know, plummet. Your energy goes down. Your uh, interest in doing things, your concentration, thoughts uh, that life's not worth living. It's a myriad of symptoms like that that kind of constitute this measure of the degree of this disease, not just the mood state of, hey, I'm sad. But, you know, it's very interesting. The last thing I'll say on that topic is you bring up a really good point, which is that um, some people think that depression got kind of programmed into us, in fact, related to it infections. Because if you are infected, you really don't want to go infect the rest of the you know, group you're in. You want to kind of withdraw. 
you want to you know have to go and rest and pull away from the group and this may have been kind of designed into us that when people get infected with various things they behave in a way that uh that is related to depression so it may have had an evolutionary cause the other thing i'll say is that you know some of the greatest writers uh and creative people are people who have had depression uh and there's a real creativity and uh, genuineness uh, of independent thought that goes to people who have been there and come back again with various mood states. Wow. And now we, we want people to understand that depression is treatable, correct? Yeah. But so that's really critical is that, you know, not only is depression not your fault, it's, uh, it's certainly an, an MS and we know for sure that this is due to the inflammation. It's not GB depressed too, because you know, look at you, Montel, you, you know, you've always been incredibly fit. You've done amazing, you know, skiing, getting dropped off with helicopters and skiing and stuff like that. So it's not, you know, gee, be depressed too, because people like you, who you look at you and you say, well, gee, this guy's got everything. He, you know, uh, looks fabulous. And yet it's the, you know, invisible symptoms. So it's not gee, be depressed too. It's due to this inflammation. But the key is, and it didn't have to be this way. The key is that it turns out our treatments for depression, uh, the combination of medications and talk therapy are the best um, work for the MS kind of depression. And not only that, it turns out that the treatments we have um, medications, we have learned now that the medications we use for depression actually have anti-inflammatory properties. And interestingly, there was an SSRI just recently given to patients who had COVID-19, and it was a double-blind placebo-controlled study. And those people that got fluvoxamine, which is an SSRI, were, had better outcomes when they had COVID-19 than those people who were on placebo. So it turns out these medicines the whole time it's been hiding in plain sight that the medicines we use for depression actually help inflammation and improve the immune system. Wow. And now so we should be looking for the most powerful anti-inflammatories that we can get, correct? Yeah. And um, yes, uh, to an extent, you know, nowadays we have such powerful um, treatments, for instance, for MS that really can come, you know, even bone marrow transplant that really reset the immune system. And again, the, the stronger our treatments, the more there is the risk of negative side effects. So, you know, I think that if your MS is not responding to what you're on and your neurologist isn't discussing with you ways of increasing the aggressiveness, if you're on, you know, some of the older treatments and have not tried the newer ones, I think you have to have another discussion with them. Well, talk to me a little bit about your research with esketamine. Is that how I'm saying it right? Esketamine? Yeah, yeah. You're saying that exactly right. So esketamine is, uh, um, it's actually on the list of 100 uh, ketamine, which is, so esketamine is just the left-handed molecule of, of ketamine. Molecules come in handedness like gloves, and there's a left-handed molecule of ketamine, which is esketamine. And this drug has been around. It's considered one of the top 100 medicines and the WHO, World Health Organization, list of important medicines because it's an anesthetic that doesn't cause you to stop breathing, like propofol killed um, you know, Michael Jackson because it stopped him from breathing. This is something that you can use an anesthetic and help people if they're in a lot of pain in the emergency room. Doesn't cause that at high doses. It is also, you know, drugs can be abused and it's used as a club drug by a certain number of people uh, who want to have these sort of uh, out of body experiences, but clinically, we know that at about a, you know a fifth of the dose that's used um, for anesthetic purposes, much lower dose, it has rapid antidepressant effects. What I find interesting, Montel, is um, we have theories about how it works, but what's interesting to me is that lo and behold. S-ketamine is an anti-inflammatory as well. It decreases the level of inflammation. I don't think that's an accident. I think that there's this story going on, just as you said, inflammation is driving a lot of this. So now are you, you're in the process of studying this with MS patients who have uh, depression? Yeah, so we we uh, were involved at Hopkins, uh, working with Janssen to do some of the phase three studies. Um, you know, multi-center studies, and we headed up the studies at Hopkins, uh, the Hopkins uh, portion that got it FDA approved. I think what's exciting about it is that, yes, um, it is something that I think can be used for MS. 
Uh, we're just starting to look at this, though. It's now being used for people, you know, who have depression that hasn't responded to anything else. Um, and yet, even in this population, what's really dramatic is that when it works, sometimes, and not insignificant amounts of times, you know, upwards of, you know, 60% of people who try it will have a rapid reduction in their depression. You don't have to wait, you know, two, three, four, six weeks. We see people who come in, they get treated once and their depression just completely, you know, disappears. It disintegrates. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I want you to, to say something that, that, you know, so, so if you don't like this question, throw it out. But is this in the same vein of, you know, the psychedelics, if you will, you know, the uh, ayahuasca, those kinds of drugs, the mushroom drugs and those things, are they all these, I understand that they have pretty powerful anti-inflammatory effect also, correct? Okay? Yeah, so it's really interesting, you know, Montel, you always ask the really sophisticated questions. So I, I work at Johns Hopkins with Roland Griffiths and his team. He's the person who just got the multi-million dollar center to study psilocybin or magic mushrooms for its antidepressant effect. And um, he's of the belief that if we prepped people for the ketamine or S-ketamine in the same way they prep people for their psilocybin, we could get some of the same effects that he does. What I find really interesting, Montel, is that one thing that's near and dear to my heart is the idea we know that people who have a purpose in life, and you have always had such a driven purpose to your life, that having a purpose in life, the belief that your life makes a difference in particular, you know, specifically by helping other people, that's, you know, so the purpose has to be woven into, you know, what you do to make this a better world by helping other people. That belief is associated with a threefold reduction in your chance of dying from all cause mortality over the age of 60, and you're two and a half times less likely to get Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, et cetera. And his studies, Roland Griffiths and his team studies using psilocybin, when they prep people for it and they prepare them for this kind of experience, um, has shown to increase people's purpose in life. And it's very hard to, you know, systematically do that. Uh, some people are born with a Montel, you know, even when you were, you know, back in military, you know, naval intelligence, you were born with wanting to make a difference and a purpose, but how to do that without it. So, you know, I think that you're on to something. I think that there may be inherent in these psychedelic kinds of drugs, including perhaps esketamine, the possibility of increasing people's purpose in life if you do it the right way. And this is this is you would be micro dosing this, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's really, really low doses. Not enough to, you know. Uh, in fact, many people don't have any psychedelic experience, but probably, you know, forty to fifty percent of people will have some kind of, you know, out of body experience or some strange sensations and stuff. So, but you know, how you deal with these things? This is just early days, Montel. So we are just learning how to do this. This has only been out for you know, a year, and it's taken a long time to get it into clinics. So it's it's brand new territory. And I'm, I'm going to throw out another one. Now, have you heard about the most recent research that's been done on flavonoids, which are a part of the, you know, cannabis sativa plant, the marijuana plant? Flavonoids now, which don't cause any euphoria whatsoever, but they are made up of the, you know, the leaves, the stems, the sticks, and those kinds of things seem to have a pretty powerful, as a matter of fact, there's some estimates that have, you know, 30 times the anti-inflammatory capability of even aspirin. Yeah. Sure. So I couldn't agree with you more, Montel. It's because, and you've been, again, a leader in this area, it's like, why the heck did did this, um, you know, therapeutic end up on a schedule one? It's just due to, you know, historical racist kind of reasons. But uh, now that we're beginning to do the research on these cannabinoid receptors, they are just coding our immune cells. And it turns out that exactly what you're getting at, we're beginning to get more and more data to say, hey, guess what? These, um, these uh, cannabidiols and derivatives of uh, these um, uh, drugs that affect the, uh, the endogenous cannab cannabinoid receptors have a powerful impact on our immune system. And, and I think you're right. I think there's there's a there there in terms of some really powerful effects we can have on pain, on inflammation that will impact people's lives and moods uh, and, and their general health. Do you think in general, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry, and I'll use that in big quotes, but 
you know, the, the big pharma is interested in this or are they just interested in this because it looks like it could be another financial vertical? Yeah, I, it's hard to say. Um, those are not mutually exclusive reasons, right? So right. the pharmaceutical industry, they're out there to earn money, uh, but hopefully to earn money by it, you know coming up with treatments that will really make a difference. So what's interesting is that we have in academia come up with a lot of great ideas. We have known exactly what the mutation is in the hemoglobin that leads to um, sickle cell anemia for over 60 years. We have no treatments based on that. So as academics, we can come up with these great ideas and we publish them and put them on books on the shelves. But it's only by realizing you got to work with you know pharmaceutical companies. We have to begin to pull these things together in order to begin to oops, in order to begin to come up with um, ways of not just learning things, but actually turning them into treatments that we can give to people and help change their lives. Wow. Excellent. Great. Unbelievable. Look, my guest today is Dr. Adam Kaplan, who's a neuropsychiatrist, and he's caring for patients with central nervous system uh, neuroinflammatory disease, such as multiple sclerosis and MS spectrum disease. He's, uh, you know, um, a, psych a psychiatric consultant to Johns Hopkins Multiple Sclerosis Center of Excellence and a clinical director of the Johns Hopkins Psychiat Psychiatric Esketamine Clinic. Doctor, I got to take a little break for a minute, pay a couple of bills, come back, and we'll pick it up. Okay? Yeah. So make sure you stay tuned for more free thinking with Monta. We'll be back right after this. Thanks so much for tuning in to Free Thinking with Monta. Today's guest is Dr. Adam Kaplan, who is a consultant at the Johns Hopkins Multiple Sclerosis Center of Excellence, and he's also the clinical director of the Johns Hopkins Psychiatric Esketamine Clinic. He has worked with patients who suffer from nervous system neuroinflammatory diseases such as MS and MS-related spectrum diseases. He's got people who travel all over the world just to come in and see him. He and, uh, just He's a wonderful, he's a friend of mine and been a friend of mine now for, I think, well, close to 20 years. Ken, Dr. Kaplan, thanks so much for being a part of the show today. So. No, it's my pleasure. God, where does the time go, Montel? 20 years. It's um, just like... <laughs> what? I, I thought about the What? Yep. <laughs> Craig? Let's talk a little bit about, you know, I want to, I don't want to set this, you know, picture of America being in crisis, but do you think that there are enough people in your profession that are thinking long term about what's going to be left? Let's say, you know, I, I, I really am very hopeful. I, I'm going to be one of those hopeful people. I, I'd rather think about the glass being half full and not half empty. So I'm thinking that, you know, even against, you know, the tide, we are going to whip COVID's ass. I mean, I really yes, do. I agree. It whipped. It's going to happen begrudgingly by those people who decide, yes, let me go ahead and take this, this vaccine, but it's going to happen. We're going to get to hear herd immunity. COVID will be around for the next 10 years. No question. We're going to see it and there are going to be cases, but there will not be the extreme number of cases that we see today. But having said that, I don't think we're even shining, you know, a match on the light of the next pandemic, which is going to be rampant depression in America. That intractable. People are not going to get out of this hole. You know, when we're looking at everything from, you know, you know, layoffs and financial woes and, you know, social strife and, you know, all the isolation that they come out of that, There'll be people who come out of that isolation acting out in ways that will be as detrimental as having the virus themselves. You know, you're so right, Montel. And um, unfortunately, you know, in this, I think it's maybe the human, uh, you know, spirit or experience, we tend to focus on the, you know, tyranny of the urgent, of the present, what's going on now. And I will tell you that what's going on now is that the health system is, you know, hunkering down. We are watching the rates of COVID go, you know, exponentially, like exponential, like he, you know, one person tells two people, two people tell four people, and pretty soon you're at, you know, at, at a complete, you know, million uh, before you know it. And so just getting ready and watching what's going on as the ICUs are starting to fill up, you know, we went from one ICU at Hopkins to five, and we are getting ready to start 
you know, expanding again, hopefully not to where we were, but who knows? It's just everything is going to be happening. And the question is, can the uh, can the vaccinations get there in time? It's going to be tough. So everybody's freaking out right now about trying to make sure that we can provide the best care possible in the tyranny of the urgent, what's going on now. But you are 100 percent right. We are going to be left. We know from people who have been infected and studies that have been done um, in Italy and China, et cetera, uh, that about 20 to 30 percent of people um, will get PTSD as a result of this. Another 30 percent of people will get depression. At least 50 percent of people will have some major mental health sequelae, some outcome of this. And that's just counting the people who are infected. For the rest of us who are just trying to hunker down and get through this, it's it's wearing on us and it's so hard to get through. So, yes, we are going to be completely overwhelmed. And you're right. People are when when this ends ends in terms of the number of infections and it gets safer to go out. It's not over. That's when the depression and, and we're going to be left with all of these things. You're exactly right. Yeah, especially the people who act out. I'm, I'm just talking about the people who are, you know, going to. You know, who I can go drink myself to till I drop. You know what I mean? And that's going to happen. You know, or who I can go drug myself till I drop, and who I can go suck myself till I drop. I mean, it's, there's going to be people who, and I, I think when you take a look at, um, you know, this entire idea of human interaction, it has literally changed the whole idea of dating the way it used to be. Now, there's a subset of society of our of our you know, society is going to do things anyway, no matter what. But, you know, I was talking to, a, 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 you know, my, my son is in his mid-20s. And he was like, you know, Dad, you know, I, I literally am just chilling. Well, his term meaning he's staying away from girls. He's doing his thing. You know, he has no interest in it because he don't feel like, you know, his, his, his attitude was, I'm not going to go out here and kill myself just to, you know, uh, have a little relationship tomorrow night. So I'm I'm done with that. And I was like, wow. Now, if I was in my mid-20s and thought to myself, I'm done with relationships. Yeah, you know? it's it's you know, your your son is incredibly bright. And and um, you know, basically what he's asking himself, is this woman worth dying for? Like, is this the person that I we should take that kind of risk? <clears throat> and so kudos to your son, who I'm sure is you know, incredibly handsome like you are, uh, uh, and uh, but to, for doing that. But what I think that people are missing in the equation is that younger people. This is a this is a disease that affects people who uh, have vulnerabilities. We know African Americans have much worse outcomes. There's healthcare disparity issues that have been plaguing us for years, decades, uh, centuries, and uh, but. It's a more of an illness of the older uh, age, you know, people who get a lot of diseases of older age. And so it's also, you know, is this person worth dying for? But it's like pulling the trigger of a gun you don't see, which is that you don't see it spreading to other people. But he gets it and then spreads it to you and, you know, you have it. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, again, people who have MS, uh, uh, are not necessarily at increased risk. It depends on the medicines they're on and that kind of stuff. But still, as you get older, the risks go up. So that's the thing that's hard to try to get people to understand is they're out there thinking of themselves, but it really is the thing that's going to affect other people. And, and those are the people who are going to pay the price. Well, you know, I, I found something else. I read an article, I think it was just today, about um, the fact that in the medical field, especially when it comes to nurses. I don't know if you saw this article, but they're saying that 30% of all the deaths in nurses from COVID are Filipino nurses. Really? No, I didn't see that. First time I've seen anything talking about, you know, another race of being, you know, disproportionately affected, but it appears that Filipino nurses have bore the brunt as nurses. And when I stop and I think about that, you know, it's the medical field that's going to, I think, be one of the biggest fields that's, you know, most affected by depression, PTSD. They've had to endure this on a daily basis. I don't know if um, you're familiar. I'm going to make sure I get you some information about a protocol that I've been working on, working with the group that 
created it. It's one of only two protocols that have been peer-reviewed, studied, and written about in medical journals all over the place. Have you ever heard of RTM? Nope. Okay, uh, recon- reconsolidation of traumatic memories is what it stands for. It is. Yeah. It is a protocol that literally is one of two that's been selected as a cure for PTSD. It runs wow. about 94, 95% uh, efficacious. And this has now been all over the world. They've studied it in London, Great Britain, and the UK, and Canada. They've used it in New York State, used it for first responders. They've been using it out west for firefighters. They've been using it for first responders in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So, And it is proven. It's, I mean, they also did a double-wide study uh, with uh, military uh, troops, and uh, 95 or 92 percent of them were not just uh, helped but cured. Almost all of their symptoms gone. Um, yet, you know, because it doesn't fit a couple of the other, or it's not one of the other protocols, it doesn't seem to be getting a lot of interest because it seems that it could actually affect some of the funding for some of these other protocols. So uh, I'm out here pushing it as hard as I can, trying to get it, you know, run through the DOD and make sure we make it available. But what are we going to do? My friend, what we were already seeing before COVID, we were already seeing a reduction in those going into the medical field. I mean, you, you, you listen to the National Certain Nurses Association, and they were saying, you know, that, you know, just due to, aging out and things like that. I mean, we were going to be in 2022 to 24, something around, you know, a half a million nurses short in this country. Uh, We were already looking at the doctor shortages of somewhere around, you know, 200, 250,000 doctors short by 2024. Now, because of COVID and we get out of this thing in let's say the next two years, I, I think that we're going to see a mass exodus because, you know, of, of those doctors who are affected by this disease, you know, uh, in a depressive way, uh, how do we win this battle, my friend? How do we convince people to come back into the fold and be those who would be willing to take care of the rest of us, the least of us? You know, Montel, it's just, again, it blows me away because just just being on this show, hearing the things that you're talking about, it inspires me. Um, with how few people are preparing for these kinds of questions. It really is. Everybody's focused on what we're going to do tomorrow uh, and the next day and how we're going to get through the next month. And you are asking all the important questions looking into the next year and the next few years. You know, we're living at a time right now where the U.S. comprises 4.2%. 2.5% of the global population, but we have 20% of the deaths and um, cases due to COVID-19. So we're 400 to 500% greater. Hey, say that again. Please say it again. Maybe slow down a little bit because I want people <laughs> to pay attention to what you're saying. Okay. So what I'm saying is the lack of forethought, the kind of forethought you're bringing up now. So how can we prevent people from dying from untreated depression and not having enough nurses and doctors? I mean, these are so crucial. And as an example of how poor we have been as a country in addressing these things ahead of time, the consequence is that although we're only 4.25% of the global population, the population of people living in the United States represent 4.25% of the entire population on this globe, on this world. And yet we're 20% of the deaths due to this COVID-19 and 20% of the cases due to this, meaning we have 500% more deaths due to COVID and 500% more cases due to COVID than the rest of the, than the world on average. And that is what happens when you don't think ahead and plan ahead and prepare. So as to your question, first of all, I have to go back and say, one, please share with me this PTSD. PTSD is such you know, a, a, a hallmark of people who end up especially going to the hospital and then all their care providers look like Darth Vader. They're covered in all these things. They can't see their family, they won't have their family come in. And um, and they have hallucinations often because they get put on heavy sedatives to prevent them from pulling out their tubes and stuff. So their experiences are PTSD, PTSD, PTSD. So I would love to get that information. I will tell you for the people at home, 
just to try to give some down and dirty advice, I talk about ABC. So A is ask for assistance. You know, don't be afraid to reach out now more than ever if you need help. B is take breaks. Give yourself a break because it's not, you're not, this is not how people are going to be behaving at their normal. This is an unusual circumstance. So give yourself a break and take breaks. You got to have some time in the day where you just, you know, pull out, relax, turn the television off, don't look at those things. Communicate. You got to actually tell people. What's going on? You're, you know, this is what you're doing, Montel. You're bringing up the communication between people. This is what you've always done. Don't do things that'll make it worse. Don't start drinking. Uh, this is not the time to self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. The E is exercise, eat right, and uh, eliminate exhaustion. Watch out for your sleep and your appetite. And then the la last thing is find your purpose. Find what you can still do to make a difference. But I agree with you 100% that these are issues that need to be addressed. Medical students right now in many institutions are not even allowed to see patients because the medical schools are too afraid of the risk uh, of having those uh, medical students get exposed. But guess what? That's part of being a doctor. You take a risk. And so, I mean, I'm not going to weigh in like I know the answers to everything, but you're right. We have to think about these things now, Montel, because it's going to be a problem. I think it's going to be a major problem. I think America is going to have a real tough wake up call. You know, let's go back to what you were just saying because your, your ABCs I think are, are profound, they really are. Um, you know, what can people do right now, sir, that are, that are sitting at home? We've had this long conversation and now I'm hoping I didn't depress more people. I hope that what I did was give them some insight and make them stop for a second and think about themselves. That's what I really think people need to do is stop for a second, think about where you are. Hmm, I wonder if I am depressed. What can I do to kind of get out of this funk? Uh, what are some of the suggestions that you have? Is that, that, that I have a few. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I, again, I would love to hear yours. One thing is tune into these kinds of things, hear what's going on, listen, not just to the, you know, the endless, uh, you know, um, you know, negative uh messaging coming through the news because of course it's the negative things that scare us that get people to tune in and then you freak yourself out listen to these kinds of shows uh that's number one but i think also what's really important to realize is that there are more you know we are now changing into a virtual uh world so one of the areas that has not been uh you know um uh shown a reduction in, in fact an increase in the number of patients uh, it has been happening for psychiatry and mental health because people uh, can be at home. They don't miss appointments. They tune in just like, you know, we're tuning in now to talk to each other. So there's lots of help out there. Don't think for a minute that you have to go to the office and see a mental health professional. You could sit at home, zoom right in and get the help you need. There are support groups out there. Think creatively about how to get help virtually and visit virtually with people. But I'd be interested in hearing your ideas, Montel. Well, I'm with you 100%. I think that honestly, one of the things that people need to do is stop thinking because we have to isolate physically, you have to isolate emotionally. You have to isolate psychologically, right? isolate from other people, human beings. You know, human interaction is probably the most important thing that we have and we can, can do. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, if you have to do it through this medium, then let's do it through this medium. It's okay. You know I mean? I don't mind, you know, looking at the, and at the screen for a few minutes. I, I did a speech um, about two weeks ago. We didn't have to go to Veterans Day. Uh, the Friday after Veterans Day, I did a virtual speech to a couple thousand people. And, you know, I literally only had my face on the screen. <laughs> I didn't have thousands of people, you know. And, and, you know, as a public speaker, you know, one of the things that a lot of us feed off of is that interaction, that, that I like the eyebrows that move, or I like the person that's twisting their seat, you know, so I can get a little immediate feedback to my comments. But I had no feedback. Yeah. Like, holy moly, and that made me stop. In my tracks, when it was over, I, you know, I, I at least got some, some feedback from people who said they enjoyed it. I, I kind of, you know, almost allowed myself to spiral down and say, you know, I could have done a better job. I don't know if I could have done a better job. You know, this was the medium that I had to do it through. But that made me realize that I need to have somebody else's face looking back at me. And why not? I mean, I, I and my wife, we talk all day. We, we, we really, you know, I love her to death and we're very close. We're here together. Um, but every now and then, you know, it's like, you know, my, my producer who's doing this, this program, you know, it, it's, 
it's so funny. The second that his face comes up on the screen saying, okay, we're ready to do our next guest, you know, puts a smile on my face because I see another human being, you know? And so I think one of the things, number two, one thing that people should do is to not feel like you have to be so isolated. I get it. With me, I don't want to have that. I, I had a couple of friends of mine come to town last week and reach out to me and say, hey, dude, you know, I'd love to get together with you. Let's let's go have some dinner. I was like, heck no. Sorry, homie. I ain't going to the restaurants. Not happening. I, I wish I could, but I'm not. Now, why don't we get together and do a Zoom? I'd love to talk to you. And so they agreed to that. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to get together and do a Zoom. So I think more and more interaction that people have outside of the confines of the isolation they need to have. Two, I think... One of those things that has bothered me now and will continue to bother me and I speak out about quite a bit is this thing. You know what I mean? We have become so reliant on this thing that, you know, a lot of people, that's the reason why I even named this podcast Free Thinking. A lot of people have stopped thinking free. They can't think beyond asking the question of Siri or asking the question of Google and don't give a damn if they retain the answer after they looked it up. And, you know, I have a voracious, I, I've always had it and I still do, and I'm glad I do. I have a voracious op, ad, appetite for knowledge. And right now, while we're isolated, what better time than to feed this thing up here with some knowledge? I mean, you know, so I think, you know, knowledge is king and knowledge is what will help us beat depression. So if people are feeling depressed, look up the word depression. Read about it and go, hmm, is that me? No, that's not me. Well, maybe it is me a little bit. Well, what can I do? Then if you're going to use this stupid thing, Google and say, well, what can I do? And then maybe what it'll do is give you the titles of about six or seven books and read a book. I mean, let's go back to something that's so simple as when you were a child. Read a book. I remember as a kid, you know, one of the, the most special things in my life was, you know, that weekly trip that my mother made us take to the library. We had to go as kids to the library and you had to pick out two books. And my father, you know, was, you know, just a, a troll about it. But my father would, you know, make you do a book report on the book that you read this week. And I was always mad about it. But, I, you know, I remember sitting down in the corner of my bedroom, reading that book, being some of my fondest memories of my early childhood, because I got to travel places that some of my friends weren't traveling to. You know, I got to imagine things that they weren't imagining. You know, I got to think about ideas that, you know, really set a foundation for who I am. You know, and that's an inquisitive person who wants to continue to learn. And, you know, even at my age now, I want to continue to learn. And so I think that that's something that people can do to help stay mentally and emotionally fit. They can actually work on it so that they understand that, you know, I don't have to be mired in that one thought process. Heck, I, you know, I, I was reading something the other day about uh, Galapagos. Why? Because I felt like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay because, you know, you, you start to read about things that you didn't know. It actually will help lift you out of whatever that, you know, depressive state that you're in. So I think the more and more people can do things like that, the better. Yeah, uh, Montel, I couldn't agree with you more. And what's so interesting, I mean, you got to write your biography at some point. I mean, you're, yeah, I know you're still halfway there, you know, uh, midlife kind of stuff, but these messages are so important. What's interesting is I will tell you, you're absolutely right, technology, if you look at the rate of suicide that has risen in this country, when did it start rising? When did it start going crazy, especially for kids, but even for across the age range, it's in the 2004, 2006 era. And then if you plot the rise of social media, it is exactly in step with the rise in suicide rates. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that could be. It's, you know, people are shifting over, they're getting wrong information, how to do it more lethally and that kind of stuff. But it's also, it is this evolution without us thinking about it of a way of communicating in an artificial world that has taken us away from the things we know that works. Real human communication, reading books, which takes you, you, you know, to these new places. We have to, I think it behooves us, Montel, for people like you and me uh, to be thinking about how can we use the technology that has just gotten away from us to help bring kids and the younger generations into 
the old things that worked, but in a way that the younger people can absorb and, and hang on to. I've been really trying my best to, to, to provide as much information as I can through this, you know, medium. And, and uh, I mean, I, I, one of those areas has been in the area recently, and I'm going to do a lot more free thinking um, podcasts on diet and exercise. I mean, I think that right now is you know, one of the things that I've, I know I've found, you know, because again, we're isolated. I stay out of the grocery store but that means I have somebody do shopping for me and they don't necessarily pick the best food. They just grab a box and put it in the thing and you know, next thing you know, it arrives my front door. We've got to start maybe taking advantage of this time to literally set a foundation. I mean, we're stuck, may as well try to figure out how much you can change about yourself rather than how much you just continue to go, you know, lockstep and do the things that you've been doing that some of them being wrong. So I've been literally trying my best to change my diet. Uh, I've changed it. You know, I, I was eating an incredible diet, I think, before, you know, COVID began, but then I kind of fell off my bandwagon and now I've got to get my butt back on. I've realized that and I'm working hard to do it, but I'm also going to work really hard to share that information with others. Yeah. And Montel, I mean, if there is a take home message from this, it really is. This is a dangerous time. This is a frightening time. If you need help, reach out and get it. But also, this is a time that you can use to better yourself, to learn new things. I think that's such an important message. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just paraphrasing you, Montel, but I think that this is such an important message now that there are things that we can do to make ourselves, you know, get through this, but also better than we would have been had we not gone through this if we do it right. I agree. Now, you know, my friend, we got, you know, now we're in a tough time. This is the holiday season. And the holiday season is always right for the you know, tough, depressive feelings for a lot of folks. Yeah. You know, we look at it as happy and gay, but we also know that, you know, there are a lot of people who feel left out during the holiday season. Now, you know, there are people who I, I, I literally am, it's, I'm sorry, I'm slightly disgusted by the level of travel uh, that's going to happen. You know, people who think that one meal is more important than one itself. I mean, I, 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 it throws me that you'd be willing to give up a hundred tomorrows for one today. Yeah. I, I just don't get it, my friend. But yeah. what you'll be looking at, you know, as they go into this holiday season, especially those who suffer from like MS and, and from other neurological disorder, what should they be thinking about ahead of time? Yeah. And again, I mean, the thing to think about ahead of time is that we're close, that these vaccines are coming you know, we're definitely by next Thanksgiving, it will be fine. You will be able to do all the things you want to do this Thanksgiving, but next Thanksgiving, this only happens once every hundred years that this kind of illness circles the globe that's lethal. So let's just get through this holiday season and not die and not kill anybody else. It will be better next season. And, you know, take care of yourself and visit electronically. Don't, you know, don't isolate yourself. There are lots of ways to communicate, just like we're doing now, Montel. And I can tell you, I'm learning a tremendous amount from this. And it's always inspirational for me to see you. And we're not together physically, but it's the communication. We're not just our bodies. We're our minds and we can still connect and uh, and take care of ourselves and one another. And so look, I'm, I, I'm so happy we we're able to talk today. Um, I'm, this one, I don't want to turn into, you know, Nikki negative, however. You, you just made, you, you said something that, you know, this only happens once every hundred years. I, I Smack me upside the head, please, because I, I need a little smack upside the head. But, you know, I've been reading, and again, sometimes you read too much, but I read the story of, uh, about, uh, it was in October, before COVID hit. I remember reading, you know, there's a news report about some scientists who were, looking at an ice core that was a million years old. And, you know, they discovered in an ice core, a virus that was, I guess, you know, same genetic makeup as HPT or HPV virus, that human papilloma virus. Yeah. They, they, rec they discovered a version of that, that was a million years old. Mm -hmm was 
something that they thought was, after they looked at it, way more virulent than the current HPV. And the ice core that they were looking at, the reason why they were looking at that ice core was because in the glacier that they were at, ice had melted down to that level. So that means that that virus has probably popped up and been blowing around the planet now for a while, you know, in the atmosphere. Are you worried that we are just at the, you know, precipice of more discoveries like COVID-19, or do you think it is truly just a one-off in the hundred year? Well, so I don't want to be a, you know, uh, a negative uh, person either. So when I say once in a hundred years, that's the Spanish flu that killed 650,000 people in this country, uh, just alone. And so, and we're on track if we don't, if we're not careful about this and using masks and, and listening to the advice you're giving, we're going to double our, you know, 260,000 currently and get up to, you know, start to approach those levels. But, and it doesn't have to happen. But having said that, those are the big ones, okay? Medium ones that are bad happen in between. HIV happened in between. It's killed, you know, Many, many people. It just hasn't gone global in the way, uh, in the same way as a pandemic. Uh, it's an epidemic, but not the same way. So things will happen in between. And you're right. You know, if on average every hundred years doesn't mean it couldn't happen in ten years from now. It's just you look back, and on average, it looks like it's every hundred years, uh, going back for you know uh, at least a few centuries. But you're right. Bad stuff can happen in between, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be prepared. We should be prepared. And I love that there's people out there thinking ahead of the time, like, what are we going to do? But I still think the message that people need to have is, let's get through this. This isn't going to happen where everybody's just going to have to run to their houses and lock down and wear masks anytime soon when we get through this, okay? That we're going to get back to society and back to living globally, uh, where there's going to be smaller uh, epidemics, you know, HPV, run wild and those kinds of things. But I don't think we're going to you know, I don't want people to think, gee, we're going to get out of this and then next year we're going to be back in it. I don't think that's going to be the case. Well, you know, you know, how about, here's a good note, you know, just like, unfortunately, out of bad things like war, we have medical breakthroughs. Yeah. We have more, there's your wife back there, hey. <laughs> um, we have hey, more. Mary. Mary, come here. But, you know, like, you know, when it comes to things like war, I mean, you know, we've seen now, you know, we've been able to, you know, have people survive from, hey, Mary, how are you? This is my my bride uh, since February. We've been locked down doing a honeymoon, Montel, and I know you and your wife are spectacular. She's my brasileira from Brazil, uh, who's been in this country, uh, you know, over a year. Uh, and uh, and we couldn't be happier, and she's made me a better man for uh, for it. So, Montel yeah. Williams. Definitely. I cannot hear you. He has uh, Oh, right. She can't hear you. You're in my ear. He definitely has a winner in you. He says you have a winner in me. Oh, thank you. I do. Thank you. <laughs> she says thanks. Thank you. So, what I'm saying is, that, you know, we've seen now, you know, we've been able to have soldiers survive catastrophic illnesses that illnesses that they would have never survived before, you know, technology really took hold. And so can we maybe shine a bright light on what's happened because of COVID? I mean, I'm sure we're seeing techniques, not via, not just the vaccines, but I'm saying techniques to take care of people that we never saw before this pandemic. So can we think that we would come out of this better prepared for just life in general? That is exactly what we need to do, Montel. You know, when, before Obama administration left, they handed the keys over to um, a system that was in place to watch for these kinds of epidemics to be released. I'm not saying that that would have solved all the problems, but we need to put even more money into our CDC and our you know, global climate awareness and how that's affecting the spread of these infections and how to you know, be proactive. But I 100% agree with you. We need to learn from this. 
Well, I can't say thank you enough, sir. I know we're almost out of time. I can't uh, really thank you enough for being a part of today's show. And I can't thank all of you for tuning in. I mean, I appreciate it. I, I think, you know, what I'm trying my best to do is get you the information that is, you know, the best that you can use to make good decisions for you and your family. Dr. Adam Kaplan, thank you for all you do. I will make sure I get you some information about the RTM program because I really do believe that this is going to be something that's going to become an integral part of, you know, uh, uh, therapy over the next 10 years. I really do believe this, and I've been working very hard to get it out there. So thank you so much, Dr. Kaplan, for being a part of the show today, man. I got to tell you, I think we've done a good job in, in giving people some information that they can use and themselves for themselves and their families. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to Free Thinking with Montel today. Thanks for joining me on Free Thinking with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please send us your comments. <laughs>